G'day and welcome back to the channel. Remember, if we're going to inundate YouTube with Shovlin videos, you've got to remember to do the like and add lots of comments. That seems to trigger the algorithm. At this stage, I'm still pulling things apart. The next thing to come off is going to be this electrical junction box down here, where the motor disconnects are. Now the main drive motor is 3 kilowatt, 3 phase, 400 volt, but it's a Darlander motor. Because of that, it had five of these big contactors, one of which was used for star and delta for startup, like make it a bit more soft starting. The others were used for selecting between the two Darlander settings and forward and reverse, etc. And I think that these big capacitors and these resistors form filters as it switches between the various different electrical contactors. Now the contactors are pretty massive. You can imagine five of those will took up a lot of space. I'm quite tempted to get a three kilowatt inverter because that way I could connect up the motor directly to the uh, inverter, removing all of this filter gear, removing four of the five big contactors and just keeping one as an e-stop contactor because I'm pretty sure that a single VFD is going to be less bulk than five of those contactors. Tell you what, if I do use a VFD, I'm kind of curious of how I'm going to coordinate between the VFD and the variator. You could argue that the variator is then no longer necessary, but the cool thing is it adds mechanical leverage, so it gives you more torque. Now with the six and a half to one back gear, maybe I don't need the extra torque of the variator, but it's kind of nice, you know, if it's all mechanically there, it'd be very easy for me just to put the, the variator control card back in, run a couple of control wires to that and get the, the variator working. It's very easy to connect up three of these wires to a VFD to get the motor working. And then I end up with basically both mechanical, oh, and electrical control of the motor speed, which is a bit excessive, but hey, why not? I don't want to break the ball off my Allen key, so I'll just use this plain Allen key for this one. There it goes. You know, I made a joke about the Swarf being gold last week, but when you look at how Swarf gets into absolutely every nook and cranny of the machine, how on earth do the, like, jewellery manufacturers control and ensure that they actually keep all of their gold, huh? Because, I mean, they're, you can see that they're all using CNC machines these days. And I'm sure they do some sort of a control to make sure that they're not losing heaps of uh, precious metals, but really, how on earth would they control this swarf? I mean, you could say better swarf control, but hey, if better swarf control was available, everyone would be using it. In fact, every used CNC machine I've ever seen has got a huge amount of swarf stuck up in nooks and crannies. Maybe there's a couple of scrap metal dealers in the, near the jewellery manufacturers that have their, their little secret, huh? I wonder if this box would be big enough to mount a 3 kilowatt VFD into it. There's a rib on the inside, so it's what's just under 18 centimetres by by 38 by, how does that lid fit? Must be about 14 or so. One extremely annoying shift later. Next, let's take out the pneumatics module. Kind of sporting doing this with plastic fittings. I'm surprised they're still functional after all these decades. It's going to be fun compressing all of this into a smaller area, but I guess we'll see. You 
Now these two skinny tubes go up to the tool changer. That's already a problem because if I move all the pneumatics down to the bottom, those are going to be too short. So maybe the pneumatics are going to have to stay at the top here. Hey, can anyone tell me why each of these pneumatic valves has got three wires coming out of it? They're almost all 24 volt DC valves. I really don't quite understand why you'd need three wires. Brown, blue and black to each. Those sockets stick out behind the casting, they need to come off. Looks like the bottom one's for the funky coolant pump, three phase, and the top one's just a single phase for the light. DD Norm nearly gave me heart failure last week when he sent me a post and pointed this out. It certainly looks like it could be a crack out of the corner of this T-slot on the headstock. I wonder if that happened in transport. Maybe something bumped up against that coolant bracket that was on there. At least that's non-structural, that's just holding the coolant. I wonder what they were doing with these mount holes. Because there's a set of sort of normal square mount holes, but they've mounted it with smaller screws right next to them. And that's the same on both sides of the x-axis. The z-axis is a bit different. It doesn't have the symmetric set of holes, but there's also sort of a weird bolt pattern of offset ones, except here at the bottom, there's one extra big one and a small one beside it. I guess now I'm going to have to get inside there and find out why they did such funkiness. And that's going to be an issue with mounting replacement motors if I, if I decide to replace these old DC ones. I think it's time I took one of these motors off and had a bit of a look at it. You know, one thing I haven't seen yet is any way of tensioning the belt that's in here. I'm assuming this is like a one-to-one -one belt drive to the ball screw, but normally you'd have some sort of oval holes to adjust the belt tension. Aha! So this is just a cover. Oh, there we have the motor. As you can see, there's the resolver on the end. Very nice little coupling between the resolver and the end of the armature. The brush carrier, and then the motor itself. It's a bit like an onion, really. Every time you take off a layer, there's another layer underneath. I'm not really sure why I thought it was a 1 to 1 reduction. Turns out it's a 17 to 50, so nearly a 3 to 1. The motor itself's got this pretty chunky coupling on it with the pulley. And the motor shaft is... 15.8? That's a... that seems weird. I wonder if that's some sort of a... some imperial dimension. That's a bit of a pain. Well, while I'm still pulling things apart, I might as well do this too. They've given a bit more free wiring here, but otherwise the hookup looks the same. Looks like they use silicon there. Nice cast iron cover. <laughs> the 
tight. Well, that took a wee bit too much force. Bent my cheap and nasty six millimeter. Oh well, I'm sure I've got more of them. This one's not even hardened. So the America's Cup finally starts tomorrow. Super excited about that. It's going to be interesting to see. I mean, all the speculation seems to be pointing towards Team New Zealand having a significantly faster boat, but I don't know. You never really know till race day, do you? Obviously, Luna Ross has got a really, really well sorted team. In the Prada Cup, they seem to make about 15 meters on Enios and every tack, so I guess we'll see whether they've got what it takes. I just hope that it's not one-sided. I hope it's not some seven to one or seven to zero route in either direction. I hope it's a nice close race. Okay, so once again, we've got another belt drive, pretty much the same. I was hoping to just turn the ball screws by hand and moving each axis, but that's, yeah, that just feels like it's just too stuck. I wonder what this bolt pitch is. Okay, so the center of those are 87 apart, which is kind of a pain. I think most of the modern motors are 90. You know, I was kind of hoping to just leave all this mechanical stuff together. You know, put on new motors, but not disassemble the, the cross slide or the saddle or the apron. But it really looks like this is all totally stuck together with dried cutting oil. So I really think it's a good idea if I get in there, make sure all of the lubricating oil passages are cleared and not blocked up with varnished up oil and give it all a good clean out, huh? Lucky I like pulling things apart. One thing that worries me a bit is whether I can even disassemble the cross slide without being able to move it. I guess if I disconnect the ball nut from the cross slide, maybe I can get this moving. Okay, this looks like an O-ring on that. Now for my next trick, let's pull off the waste scraper and loosen up the gib. See if that loosens it up. One minute, 37 seconds later. So that way scraper popped off. A little bit of a thrust washer or something on there. I'll just leave that together. But what I was looking for is this. This should be the gib screw. Okay, the gib adjustment screw and the gib itself. And now with the gib removed, I must be able to move this around a bit. Here we go. Now it's loose. Now I can just move the ball screw. It's very gummed up, but it does move. The next day. Well, it took quite a while to actually get the cross slide off because I had to manually wind it to the end of its travel and the ball screw was very gummed up. As you can see, I've got a wee bit of rust down this end. Uh, it looks like a wee bit of rust in the middle, but otherwise, first look, it doesn't look like there's much wear. Let me bring in a little closer here. Here's a close-up of the surface finish of the way. As you can see, it's got kind of a very fine crosshatch pattern machined into it. I wonder if Schaublin uses this instead of scraping as their oil retention pockets. One little burr on the side there to stone out. I must say I'm getting happier about this by the minute. This appears to be about the most wear on the cross slide. It hasn't taken off all of the cross hatching, it's just polished the top of it. There's nothing to be felt with the, the fingernail. So yeah, the wear looks really minimal. All right, 
So the first day of racing on the America's Cup is over. And as we hope for, it's uh, pretty close, huh? All of those people saying that the Kiwi boat was, you know, two or three knots faster than anybody else, I think that's not true, huh? Seems they're pretty well matched and it's going to be a good close regatta. Yeah, may the best, best team win. In this case, hopefully Team New Zealand. <laughs> When it comes to taking rust off cast iron, nothing beats a razor blade. It's a good old single-sided razor blade. It's fantastic for it. Tomorrow. Moving over now to the guiding ways on the saddle. Once again, all looks pretty nice and undamaged. I don't see any galling or anything to any real obvious damage to it all. The ball screw looks in a very nice shiny condition. No pitting or anything. Even with the cross slide removed and the ball nut nice and free, it's still quite difficult to turn the ball screw. Like there's a lot of either really quite hardened grease in the bearings or they have extremely high preload. But yeah, you can move it, but it's certainly not easy. I'll take the ball screw out and just give those bearings a new greasing, I think. Once again, here, the only metal I find or any swarf I find is, is brass. Along the back here, this is where the gib strip goes. The gib strip also looks in pretty nice condition. No galling. Still see machining marks pretty well distributed over the whole, whole surface. Next up back here, there's a cover for the wiring for the end stop switches. I believe these are Hall Effect sensors for their two ends of travel. It's a little bit gunged up, needs a good clean out. Just leave those on to protect them. Yesterday. I'm going to pull the motor off this adapter plate because I need to start thinking about how I'm going to adapt new motors onto this lathe. Well, these bolts are pretty damn tight as well. I wonder if someone's going to put in the comment section, those aren't bolts, those are screws. <laughs> Actually, while it's still in there, I think I'll probably take the coupling off. Probably still going to need a puller to get this off, I imagine. The clamp's not terribly tight. So I probably can just use a puller on it. This one seems a bit rusty. That's interesting, they even put an o-ring around there. It's a pretty nice piece for a, just a motor adapter plate. Well, I've now completed six races in the America's Cup and there's nothing in it, is there? I mean, it seems that uh, Emirates Team New Zealand's probably a little bit slippery and a little bit faster, but has to sail a little lower. Looks like Luna Ross has got a better sort of high angle slow mode which is especially advantageous in the start and it also looks like neither of them really like the light, light winds they've had today it's already the closest America's Cup since like 1982 I think so now it would be it would be nice to see a little more a little more passing on the on the actual track but I guess with the very steady wind conditions they've had for the first six races there wasn't really much in it there. Let's hope some more breeze comes up. Let's hope they move on to one of the closer in stadium courses which has more, more variable winds. And let's hope Team New Zealand wins. And hey, thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you again for the next episode.